the gospel and sermon text for today is Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. Luke, that's the assigned um, uh, lectionary text for today. But in order to, to add a little more context, I'm going to read from verse 1, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then continue with verse, verse 5. Okay, verses, so I'm reading Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. To give it a little bit more context. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for sin are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on your guard. If a brother or sister sins, you must rebuke an of the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And, if, and in, if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. Continuing with verse 5. The apostle said to him, said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in, come in from plowing or tending sheep, in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me? Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may, you may, you, later you may eat and drink, but do you, do you thank a slave for, for doing what was commanded? So you also when, when, when you have done all that you have, you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so our, our sermon text, our sermon title is Give Us more faith. Give us more faith. Will you pray with me? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Holy God, as we hear your word and read and <coughs> read and proclaim, Guide us to learn the, the sound teaching you have for us. With the help of the Holy Spirit, entrust to us your good, met, your good treasure, and through it, make us alive in our faith. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Give us more faith. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And you know, you know, many of us Christians are familiar with the meaning of faith as written in the New Testament book of Hebrews. And it reads, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, our understand, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the, by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. And you can continue to read that in Hebrews chapter, chapter 1. 
the apostles, the apostles asked for more faith. And I believe because the demands of the of the of the of the first four verses that I read are harsh and, and beyond normal human behavior. And I'm, I'm reminded of, of a quote by football coach John Heisman, for whom the Heisman Trophy is awarded. He once said to his team just before a game, it would have been better for you to have died as a child than to fumble this football. And Jesus would have you drown in the sea if you fumbled life's football by causing someone to stumble. The apostles reasoned that in order to meet Jesus' demands, and I imagine from the tone of his voice, and they, they knew he wasn't kidding, <clears throat> they reasoned that they needed more faith. They also recognized that faith comes from God. And that's why they came to the Son of God for more faith. And in, in the five times faith is mentioned in, in Luke's gospel, they all relate to faith, faith as faithful behavior. So Jesus uses exaggerated language using the mustard seed and the mulberry tree in his description of the power of the tiniest bit of faith. You may recall Jesus' rebuke, O ye of little faith. He, he rebuked Peter and others and, and, and the disciples. And the, the exaltation he had for those to have to have found to have, have great faith. He said, Such faith I haven't found in all of Israel. And he said that to the Gentile woman whose daughter was ill, and, and to the centurion whose servant was ill, and he healed them. And this is the story in Matthew 17, that there's a story where the disciples could, could not heal the epileptic boy. You may remember that story. And Jesus called, called them faithless. And translating the word faith and applying it to the, to the various situations in which faith is referred to in the Bible, we can get a little, little bit confusing. And, and I, I believe <clears throat> required faith is faith in God, not faith in yourself or faith in, in other people or in faith in money or weapons. The power behind the faith that Jesus mentions in, in, is God's power. And it is the faith in God that allows us to, appro to appropriate, to grab hold of that power. And we read in our gospel lesson, you could, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and, and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The more familiar version in Matthew talks about moving a mountain, in, in, a mountain in, instead of a tree, and, and heaving it into the sea. The point is that faith, even in small amounts, have great power. People of faith tap into God's power, and they believe in God, and they believe God. Therefore, the words of, of the hymn, all things are possible if you only believe. Remember those? Remember that hymn? Even mountains are thrown into the sea, or a mulberry bush, bush roots and all can grow in the sea with just a little bit of faith. And it is not our faith doing wonderful works, but the God who stands behind that faith. Our faith is like a $100 bill printed on paper that's worth only a penny. On that $100 bill, that piece of paper, it's just a piece of paper. That's our faith. But what's printed on that piece of paper, it says that it is backed by the full faith and trust of the government of the United States. 
And so also our faith, our faith has value. And only because God blesses faith and empowers that faith and backs it up. So how do we get that powerful faith? Well, the first thing I believe we, we can all, we all should do is pray that God will increase our faith and give it power. Prayer is the number one thing we do in life. Increasing faith is impossible without prayer. Association with other people or, or, of faith also helps to increase our faith. Participating in, 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 in worship life of the church is, is very important. Reading and studying the scriptures inform and correct our faith. <clears throat> and it don't only allow others to, to tell you of, of what the Bible says. Read it for yourself and ask questions. Without the guidance of scripture and fellowship with, with like-minded Christians, we will have faith in, in, in something smaller than God like money or, or charismatic people, like some of the pulpit pimps we see on television. And I recently re read that, that we grow in faith as we act in faith. Exercise strengthens our, our muscles. Acting in faith attracts the love of God, the power of God, and the grace of God. Uh, Baptist pastor and evangelist Dr. Frederick Brotherton Meyer tells of a meeting of a church that wanted to hold a revival. And during the meeting, an elder got up and said to Dr. Meyer, I don't think there's going to be a revival here as long as Brother Jones and I don't speak to each other. And he went across to Jones and said, Brother, you and I haven't spoken to each other in five years. Let's bury the hatchet. Here is my hand. And he extended the right hand of fellowship. And shortly afterwards, another elder got up and said, Minister, I think there will be no revival here while I say nice things about you. And, and to your face, and I'm disloyal to you behind your back. I want you to forgive me. Soon others were on their feet, settling old scores. Then, says Meyer, God began to visit them. The meeting was crowded, and a revival broke out that swept over the whole district. And faith also means believing even when the outcome seems in doubt. Doubt can sometimes undermine your faith, and optimism can turn it around into a positive outcomes. We saw powerful faith at work in, in South Africa since the end of apartheid. The, that, that extreme racial segregation lasted 46 years from 1948 to 1994, and a great many people were afraid that after years of tyranny and injustice, a race war would break out. It did not, in large part, because of the Truth and Justice Commission, which was led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who led the whole nation in prayer and the church, the Dutch Reformed Church, in prayer. And past sins were brought to light, and the perpetrators and victims were brought together. And there was time for confession and an offer of forgiveness and healing. There could be, there could be no forgiveness without repentance and confession, and there could be no healing without recognizing the disease. 
powerful faith was at work through the prayer and belief in, in, in a positive outcome. Out of the movement to abolish apartheid and the sinful separation of people in South Africa, the Belhar Confession of the Dutch Reform Mission Church in South Africa was adopted and was adopted in 1986. And you know that that Belhar Confession has since been adopted by the Presbyterian Church USA in, in June 2016. The Belhar Confession is now part of our denomination's constitution, having been added to our Book of Confessions. And I encourage you, especially elders and deacons, to read it if you haven't already. It's part of our book of confessions. It was the last thing that was added. That was in 2016. How do you spell Belhar? Uh, I, I will email it to everyone. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. In, in our text, Jesus tells what seems like a parable about, let's call it the parable of the unappreciated servant or unappreciated slave. In this parable, it, it, it's difficult for a few reasons. First, it seems as if Jesus is approving slavery. He's not, of course. And second, it seems to be uncaring and unfair. And third, this situation is not our experience. We are accustomed to rewarding faithful employees, and we are accustomed to being rewarded. And this story doesn't com commend slavery any more than the parable of the Good Samaritan commends mugging people. Jesus simply uses a, a situation common in this day to illustrate a spiritual truth that our relationship with God depends on the grace of God. And this is a hard but important reality for us to understand. Life as a devout Christian is often difficult. We are often tempted to feel that God has abandoned us. And you, even Jesus cried out on the, on the cross, in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But once you have adjusted your attitude, as suggested by Jesus, you can meet the most severe temptations that come your way as followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus modeled the kind of servant ministry to which he calls us. He came to earth not in, 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 in Rome, but in Palestine. Not with a silver spoon, in, silver spoon in his mouth, but with a feeding trough as his cradle. Not in a time when he could address the world on television or on Facebook or on Zoom or on his cell phone, but when communications was limited to reach to the reach of his voice. He came not to sit on a throne, but to hang on a cross. If we have a problem with the demands of discipleship, we must address our, our objection to the one who has modeled the kind of sacrifice that he asks us to make. Does he thank that servant? The issue is, whether the master is, is indebted to his servant for carrying out the master's orders. This rhetorical question anticipates the response, no. The point is not that God does not reward obedience, but that obedience, that our obedience, is never, never puts God in our debt. Our salvation is therefore always dependent on God's grace, God's undeserved favor, God's gift. We stand in need of grace every day. 
we, <clears throat> we, we would be su supremely foolish to stand before God at judgment day and request to be judged on the basis of justice instead of grace. You see, with justice, we get what we deserve. With mercy, we don't get what we deserve. But with grace, we get what we don't deserve. And we're not perfect and will never be perfect. No, no matter how much we, 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 we do in response to God, it will never be enough to, <clears throat> to pay the debt we owe to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we have the power to be God's people. We have the power to, 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 to be the Sunday morning Christian at worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ as we, have, as, we, as we are this morning. And we have the power to be Monday morning Christians to the people in our community, to, the, to be the Bible that the, the, the people will read when they see us, and the people to have even that little faith, like a mustard seed. that little faith that can uproot trees and move mountains and bring us to eternal life. Keep and have us keep the faith. Lord, give us more faith. Amen. Would you pray with me? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for ears to hear and hearts that understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, brothers and sisters, now that you've been to church, let's go out and be the church. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God has spoken this morning. So let the church say, Amen. 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 Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's go out and be the church. Beautiful. Amen. Go out and be the church. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Layla. And thank you, James. Thank you.